In the previous texts and the video, we have explored the world's linguistic diversity. We have heard about the key discourses linking language to citizenship, and we have looked at the linguistic inequalities resulting from these discourses. This presentation deals with two approaches that oppose the exclusion of people who do not have officially recognized languages in their repertoires. The linguistic human rights approach on the one hand and the linguistic citizenship approach on the other. We then discuss the concept of language behind these two approaches. Both approaches are described in an article written by Christopher Stroud in 2001 and evaluated with regard to their successful use in lang language teaching in the South African context. The linguistic human rights approach is designed to overcome historically based linguistic inequalities. It is aimed at the administrative and institutional fields, for example, the field of education, the judiciary and the administration. The authorities are responsible for implementing and enforcing linguistic human rights. A concrete example would be school teaching in a language that is not the official language in the respective country. The lessons would be implemented accordingly by the school authorities of that country. Linguistic citizenship, on the other hand, puts democratic participation first. It emphasizes cultural and political voice and agency by recognizing all sorts of linguistic practices, uh, mixed, low status or transgressive, as relevant to social and economic well-being. It is primarily directed towards grassroots activities outside state administration. The most profound difference between linguistic human rights and linguistic citizenship is the perception of language behind the two approaches. Linguistic human right relies on the widespread view of language as a named language. Languages are here seen as bounded, pure, natural objects, consisting of structured sounds, grammar and lexicon. Linguistic citizenship, on the other hand, applies the notion of linguistic repertoires. Boundaries between linguistic features get blurred when these features picked up during a linguistic biography get clustered together in the, in the act of communication. Linguistic repertoires consist of the plurality of styles, registers, genres and practices that have been picked up in the course of a biography. All these repertoire components have spe specific functions such as communicating with the family, socializing with neighbors, working, express, is, expressing one's belonging to a group, establishing a relation to a foreigner, praying or constructing complex abstract correlations. One of the central aspects of linguistic citizenship is the concept of voice, defined as individual communicative power in the here and now. This communicative act of participation, the raising of one's voice, has then to be remembered, recorded or reproduced in other contexts to other audiences. This is what Rampton et al. call text trajectories. Communicative acts are transported into other settings, decontextualized, where they are again interpreted, recontextualized. The framework linguistic citizenship with the analytical category voice, thus, enables us to better understand the resonance of communicative practices.